tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Two seemingly unrelated murder investigations lay dormant in the files of neighboring Virginia police departments until a routine review of DNA evidence proves that two cases have a common suspect and the hunt is now on for a serial killer. A factory in New Hampshire, an isolated security guard, and a mysterious fire. Elements of a baffling night to see Curtis Pichon vanish without a trace. A Texas woman was robbed and murdered in her own driveway. Leaves were few and the case soon grew cold. Now more than a decade later, Detective Robin Talton is in hot pursuit of Opal Zacharias's ruthless killer. A 21-year-old Louisiana college student disappears after a night of partying in Shreveport. Who are the two men with whom she was reportedly last seen? Could her ex-boyfriend have been involved? Where is Wendy Elizabeth Long? Join me for these stories and more. Perhaps you may be the one to solve a mystery. December 6th, a worker surveying an out-of-the-way wooded property in Fairfax County, Virginia, makes a gruesome discovery. The partially clothed body of a young woman lay sprawled in a clearing. She has been shot, and it appears she has been sexually assaulted. Her jeans, purse, and red shoes are piled neatly nearby. Once the police arrived on the scene, uh, they began cordoning off the area. This area is just too far off the beaten path for most people to come. As they were stretching the crime scene tape and walking the area, they discovered a second body nearby. The young man has been shot once in the head, execution style. Like the woman, he carries no identification. The victims will soon be identified as 22-year-old college sweethearts, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton. The baffling murders have remained unsolved for more than a decade. But recently, dramatic advances in forensic science and an incredible connection to a previous unsolved mystery story produced a major break in the case. Warren Fulton was a captain of the George Washington University baseball team and hoped to one day play in the major leagues. Rachel Raver was a vivacious, well-liked recent graduate of George Washington who was planning to go to law school. She and Warren had met at a local hangout and had been dating for several months. On December 3rd, Rachel and Warren met friends for drinks at a Washington, D.C. bar. I like that. I love it. And he was not. At 12.30 a.m., they called it a night and were last seen walking to their car. It's my belief that they probably encountered someone near their car or on their way to the car. Investigators theorize that Rachel and Warren were probably abducted at gunpoint and forced to drive from Washington into the Virginia suburbs west of the city. Just tell us where you want us to go. Can we just give him the car? I want to get out of the car. I just want to get out. I do too, sweetie. The terrifying ride would have covered a distance of about 20 miles. Once at the obscure wooded site, police believe the gunman apparently right, wasted no time. Come on. Okay, okay just, can you leave us here and take the car? Don't hurt us, please. Warren was probably killed as soon as they got into the woods. Rachel would have seen that. We think probably at that point she ran.
After mortally wounding Rachel, the killer then sexually assaulted her. Police believe the assailant fled in Rachel's car, but he unknowingly left clues to his identity. Semen recovered from Rachel's body contains his DNA. A single hair retrieved at autopsy revealed the killer's race, African American. And his choice of location for the murder scene told investigators he was probably familiar with the surroundings. The area where the bodies was found was uh, very close to the, the Dulles Toll Road, uh, a major road that runs from uh, Interstate Highway to Dulles Airport. Uh, however, the area where the bodies were specifically is, is very secluded, uh, and you would not have known about that area if you weren't familiar with this particular area. Two days after the bodies were found, the Fulton and Raver families had their worst fears confirmed. In time, Rachel's mother, Veronica, would channel her grief into action. I didn't feel angry for several months, and then one day I got up, and I got mad. And my attitude was, who the hell does he think he is? And that's when I started healing and looking for him. Along with Rachel's sister, Dee Dee, Veronica became obsessed with seeing that Rachel and Warren's killer was caught. Marshall. The Ravers immersed themselves in every detail of the case. What's Marshall? Oh, there's an article here about a suspect who killed a young girl. No rape. Um, the date was roughed up. He wasn't killed, so... It's not the same thing. Yeah, I know. I know. We'll, we'll get it. We'll do it. Believing that Rachel's missing car was a key to solving the case, the Ravers focused their search on finding it. And even though she lived in suburban New York City, Veronica Raver spent her free time driving the streets and highways around Washington looking for that car. Going down to D.C., I would stop, you know, at those wayside rest areas, and I'd go through every parking lot, all the way down to D.C., all the way back on the other side of the highway. I was obsessed. Just as hopes were dwindling, six weeks after the murders, there was a major break in the case from an unlikely source. I came home from work, and I took the mail it's from, you know, the uh, motor vehicle for tickets. And when I opened it up, I thought, whoa. Oh, God. Norm, it's the car. Rachel Raver's missing Toyota sedan had been ticketed for illegal parking on a street in Queens, New York. The date on the ticket was the day after the murders and two days before the bodies were discovered. The car was sitting unattended on a New York City street, so you can imagine what happened to it. By the time it was recovered, there wasn't much left of it. The car was taken to a garage in New York City where it was processed extensively and a number of, of latent fingerprints were developed and we weren't able to identify anyone. So basically we came away with, with no clues from the car. Despite the latest setback, Veronica Raver refused to give up. Almost a full year after the murders, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries caught her attention. On May 10, 1988, the body of an unknown young woman was found in an Arlington, Virginia schoolyard. She had been sexually assaulted and shot once at point-blank range. She was sexually assaulted and then murdered. The victim was subsequently identified as 24-year-old Tina Jefferson, a newcomer to the Washington, D.C. area. One good suspect admitted that he had seen her the day that she was killed, and he was able to describe her all the way down to her red shoes. Uh, Unsolved Mysteries came on about this young woman who had been shot, and I don't know what attracted me. I, I think it was the date. The date was also Rachel's birthday that got my attention. It's something about it. I called up my daughter, Dee Dee, and uh, asked her to check on this that, you know, something about it, it bothered me. 
When I spoke to the detective about it, he told me that he had looked into the case too because it bothered him a lot. But the case was so different and her killer seemed to know her. And we assumed um, that in Rachel's case that it was a stranger. The discrepancies between the cases were significant. Rachel Raver was white, while Tina Jefferson was African-American. Rachel was in the company of her boyfriend. Tina was alone. And while investigators believed Tina knew her killer, it was suspected that the attack on Rachel and Warren had been random. Years would pass, and both murder investigations would grow cold, until one day in the spring of 2000, a technician at Biotech 2, Virginia's state DNA lab, was routinely running comparisons on samples submitted by law enforcement agencies. She was able to develop the most vital lead either of these cases had had to that date, and also prove Veronica Raver's instincts were on the mark. I received a phone call from the serologist at our lab, uh, and she says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Uh, the good news is we got a hit on your case in the Virginia Data Bank. Uh, the bad news is the hit is on another unsolved homicide. That other unsolved homicide was the murder of Tina Jefferson. It was now scientifically proven. Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton were murdered by the same person who killed Tina. Investigators also now had confirmation that a serial killer was on the loose. My husband got a phone call from the detectives and they told him that they had a cold DNA hit. Uh, and it matched uh, another case that was seven months after our daughter, Tina, and it was the Fulton and the Ravers case. And um, shortly afterwards, uh, Deidre Raver got in touch with us. When I met the Jeffersons, it was as if I had known them for years. And we feel as though we've been grieving together for the last 12 years. On Rachel's birthday, their daughter was murdered. And for the last 12 years, we've been grieving on the very same day. The Ravers and Jeffersons now had hopes that this new development would lead to a successful resolution of their cases. Once we make the DNA link you know, between these murders, and then we can go back and we can closer examine these murders, we start to see some small similarities. The red shoes, I think, are fascinating. Uh, I think it's probably more than coincidental, though, that they were both wearing red shoes. In the Arlington County case, they have a composite drawing of a suspect. Uh, they have a face to go with the DNA, and we never had that before. Witnesses described him as a clean-cut bodybuilder type, an African-American approximately six foot three inches tall and weighing 170 pounds. Tina Jefferson was last seen alive in his presence. The Ravers and the Jeffersons have been revitalized by the DNA link and are now more hopeful than ever that the killer of their loved ones will be caught. I won't rest until he's found. I really won't have any peace until he's found. He's an evil predator, an evil perverted predator. He's dangerous. I like for him to go through the pain and the hurt that I have gone through for 13 years. Uh, I, will, I would like to see him face to face. Seabrook, New Hampshire, 1.42 a.m. The unexpected disrupts a normally tedious graveyard shift of security guard Curtis Pichon. 911, report a car fire. His car is inexplicably burst into flames. Curtis, a former police officer, informs the fire department that he has no idea how his car caught on fire. The firefighters notice that under the circumstances, he seems curiously subdued. 
Two hours after the firefighters leave the scene, the mystery deepens. Curtis abruptly disappears without a trace. The whole disappearance is confusing. Uh, the car fire is confusing because even without the car fire, there's no clues here. This is a worse nightmare for any investigator because there's not that tangible lead to go on and, and an entire family that, that wants answers and deserves answers and hasn't been able to get them. What happened to Curtis Pichon? Every possibility considered by investigators led to a dead end. They thought Curtis might have purposely destroyed his car before engineering his own disappearance. But they found no other way for him to leave the remote factory where he worked. They considered suicide, but where was his body? They also believed Curtis could have been abducted, but there was no evidence supporting that conclusion. For 10 years, Curtis Pichon cherished his career as a police officer. Then he was stricken with multiple sclerosis, a painful muscular disorder that severely limited his mobility. The disease progressed to the point where he could no longer accurately fire his gun. He had no choice but to turn in his badge. i would never seen Curtis so devastated in my life. His personality changed. He became sort of a quieter, and I don't think even up to the time of his disappearance, he really knew what he was going to do the rest of his life. Hey, Curtis. How you doing? Hey, how are you? According to his family, Curtis became depressed and withdrawn. After taking on a frustrating series of odd jobs, he found a new sense of satisfaction as a factory security guard. The job's physical requirements were less stringent than those of a police officer and he was not required to carry a gun. The night he vanished began like every other. At midnight, two and a half hours into his shift, all was normal. How's it going, Curtis? It's going good, how about you? Busy? Uh, no, sir, quiet as a mouse. At 1.42 a.m., Seabrook firefighters responded to Curtis's call for help. He pretty much said that he saw a bunch of smoke and some flame, and he, then he went to find a fire extinguisher and then went to put the fire out. One fire extinguisher is not going to have much effect, but we did notice that he did try to put out the fire. There have been cases where security guards, building superintendents, and things like that intentionally set fires and put them out just to get recognition, but uh, I don't have any idea um, or gut feeling how, how the fire started or, or why the, the case ended up the way it did. When the firefighters arrived on scene, they had conversation with him, and they found him to be totally accepting almost. It was, he was not in the least upset with, or did not appear to be upset. Curtis's stoic behavior was all the more curious because his car, as always, had been cluttered with many of his possessions. His family said he had the odd habit of using it to store what he treasured most. Curtis's reaction to the fire, uh, I find surprising. I would think that if uh, he had seen his car on fire with his belongings in it, that he would have been very upset. I would think he would have been almost in tears and in shame, and I can't believe he was quiet, timid. Two and a half hours after the fire was extinguished, the factory's security supervisor checked on Curtis. Are you all right? Yeah. You okay? Yeah. He left Curtis at 3.25 a.m. 20 minutes later, 3.45, a factory worker was the first to notice that Curtis was missing. An exhaustive search of the factory and the surrounding area turned up nothing. Our very first thoughts about what happened to Kurt was that he could have uh, taken his own life, he could have wandered off, or he could have been abducted. 
One thing that we thought of in terms of trying to flush out that uh, the suicide scenario was the fact that he had purchased this pistol just, uh, I guess, a few days prior to uh, his disappearance. Curtis bought the 9 millimeter gun from his father, Nicholas. Suicide was a possibility with somebody in Curtis's condition with MS. He had lost a job that he wanted all his life. But his mood when he, on the weekend that he did pick up the gun and everything, seemed to be more happy, more pleased with himself. I'm doing good, Dad. Suicide seemed a likely solution. However, Curtis's gun could not be found. Police could find no trace of it in his car or in his apartment. Then, as Curtis's family cleaned out his cluttered residence, they made a surprising discovery. I think I found what we were looking for. Once I discovered the, the weapon, um, uh, I think that we eliminated the likelihood that Kurt had taken his own life. Now we had narrowed it down to, I believe, one of two things. One, that Kurt uh, uh, broke down uh, mentally and had wandered off. And then the other one was, of course, uh, a much more or much darker scenario where Kurt was abducted and probably murdered. The first possibility that Curtis had suffered a mental collapse prompted investigators to focus once again on the mysterious fire. They believed Curtis might have accidentally started it, then became so despondent over losing his prized possessions that he simply walked away. There is absolutely no way that Curtis would have or even could have wandered off by himself under these circumstances. Curtis was a smoker. Smokers don't leave cigarettes. You, know, you, don't, you don't go anywhere without your cigarettes. It doesn't happen. So he didn't just walk off. And he had deteriorated enough that he probably physically couldn't probably walk two miles, let alone uh, want to do it. There are histories of individuals who we do not anticipate can travel any extended distance who, in fact, are located several miles away from their, their original starting point. I would tend to doubt it, but it is possible. The possibility remained that Curtis called for a taxi or hitched a ride on a truck leaving the factory. But investigators discovered that no cabs or company trucks left the plant during Curtis's shift. One disturbing possibility remained, that Curtis was abducted and murdered. I think Curtis went to work like he always did that night, and I think that he probably, uh, in carrying out his duties, saw something that he shouldn't have, and he probably carried out his, his true duty of either re getting ready to report it or call it in, and he was attacked, and he couldn't defend himself. Investigators exploring the possibility of foul play found that a door and two vending machines had been damaged during Curtis's shift. But who caused the damage remains unknown. With regard to criminal activity that Curtis may have encountered, anything is possible. One individual that we spoke with took note about 3.30 of two vehicles departing the premises. My best guess is that somebody abducted him and did him in and dispose of the body in such a way that it hasn't shown up yet. I don't have much hope that Curtis is alive. I think if he was alive, he would have reached out already, and he never would have put us through this. It'd be very difficult if he had been killed in a plane crash, but I have no idea what happened to him. It was even more difficult. I miss my brother. I miss Curtis. I was his best friend. And uh, I, I miss him. I miss him very much. Curtis Pichon is five foot nine and weighs 165 pounds. He has brown eyes and graying brown hair. Eight a.m. Houston, Texas. Sixty-four-year-old Opal Zacharias left her home for work. She had no idea that two men were lying in wait in her garage. Who are 
you. Take it easy, lady. What do you want? We just cool. want your purse. Be cool. No. Yes. Hey, Let's just give us a no. 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 Give us a purse. The plan may have been to simply rob her, but there was a struggle. Sadly, Opal Zacharias lost her life after being victimized by two cold-blooded assailants. Stories like this happen in the United States far more often than we'd like to believe. But what makes this case unique is that it currently rests in the expert hands of one of the most successful cold case investigators in the country. Her name is Robin Talton, and she's one of this nation's toughest female cops. Over the years, the veteran detective has proven herself time and again in an arena dominated by men. June 2000, a machine shop in Houston, Texas. Plainclothes Harris County Sheriff's Detective Talton and her partner responded to a tip that a wanted felon was on the premises. We were told he had escaped three different times. So he was a known rabbit, and we figured that he would run from us. The manager there was very cooperative. He, uh, he actually agreed to point the guy out. Detective Talton, Harris County, you're under arrest. Let him go, I got him. <laughs> Although Detective Talton knew she'd been injured, she was determined to conceal her condition until the arrest was made. The detective that was with me kept after the defendant, and he did get him. And I did not want this crook to know that I was hurt. We walked him down to where the unit was. Are you okay? Yeah, man, I'm hurt. I'm hurt bad. Can you make it back to the car? Yeah. Apparently, a burst of adrenaline masked the severity of Robin Talton's injury. She was stunned when doctors told her she chipped her left kneecap and fractured the lower leg in two places. This arrest would change her life. You feeling okay? Yeah, all right. While Detective Talton recovered from her broken leg, she was assigned to the newly created cold warrant unit. What we'd like to do is get you to working on a computer and see if you can find some new sources of information uh, where we can find these guys. And maybe we can Her new them. unit was set up to trace and apprehend Harris County's wanted felons. Many of these criminals have been on the lam for more than a decade. The dramatic sudden shift in career might have shattered anyone else in Robin's shoes. But the thought never crossed her mind. From the start, she was driven to turn tragedy into triumph. A desk job was not going to hamper her effectiveness. Hey, I'm in. I'm in. OK, can we start tomorrow? We can do that. OK, great. The veteran investigator with more than 10 years as a street detective under her belt would now need to get accustomed to a couple of new partners, a computer and the internet. Detective Talton now found herself armed with faded warrants and often obsolete information. However, she quickly proved to have a talent for tracking down long-lost fugitives. It's kind of like a game of, you know, catch me if you can. Sometimes I start with just a name, an age range, and an old address. And I put together past acquaintances, family members, uh, trying to find somebody that could fit. It's like putting the pieces together to see if it's gonna make sense. By the time I get the warrant, it's old enough that I feel like these guys have settled down and they think they're safe. The cold warrant unit uh, is a little bit deceptive. It's, it's, it's not a, a band of, of detectives, it's one detective, Robin Talton. And uh, after she does her research, we have about an 80% rate of arrest mm -hmm. once she handles those warrants. Yeah, I sure am. To date, Detective Talton's work with a cold warrant unit has led to the arrests of more than 400 dangerous fugitives. However, despite her successes, she's still challenged by the cases she has yet to crack, like the 1987 ruthless murder of Opal Zacharias. 
Even as Opal lay wounded on her driveway, the robbers were not finished with her. From what I remember of the gunshot wound, uh, apparently entered the thigh and came out the back of the hip. So the, the shot itself was not a fatal shot. Go, 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 go. But they had her purse and car keys and ended up stealing the, the car and backing over, and that's actually what killed her. A witness reported seeing one of the men flee the scene by scaling a fence. Later that day, Opal Zacharias's abandoned car would be found. However, at the time, it yielded no clues that would lead to Opal's killers. A year later, tips from an informant identified the murder suspects. One of the men was apprehended living outside Houston. Despite the fact that the man's fingerprints were on Opal Zacharias's car, authorities could not physically connect him to the murder, and he was released without charges. The alleged trigger man was identified as Lance Bedgood, who was still at large. Robin Talton tackled the case in 2001. While trying to locate Lance Bedgood, I came across some post office boxes, three in fact, that are still being looked at today. What we're assuming is that he's using three different post offices, basically as a mail drop, so he can keep in contact. Detective Talton discovered the mailboxes are registered to three of Lance Bedgood's relatives, but paid for by a fourth. Well, I'm glad that the investigation hasn't been forgotten. Uh, the, the sad part is, is that uh, my aunt's life was taken, and she didn't get to see the, the family grow up and mature, and that's sad. Lance Bedgood stands five foot nine inches tall. He has tattoos on his arms and legs, as well as a scar over his left eye. He is wanted for the murder of Opal Zacharias. Bedgood should be considered armed and dangerous. On a Sunday spring afternoon in Cushata, Louisiana, Carol and Duke Long received a telephone call from a friend of their 21-year-old daughter, Wendy. Um, good. Listen, I have Wendy's car. I just wanted to know how to get it back to you guys. Where's Wendy? Hi, honey. Two days earlier, on Friday the 13th of April, Wendy had driven to Shreveport to shop and party with friends. Her parents expected her home by Sunday afternoon. Instead, they received news that is every parent's worst nightmare. Wendy had disappeared. I thought she was with you. No, I haven't seen her since Friday night. We called the police and told them that we thought something had happened to Wendy. And that's where it all started. Somebody knows where Wendy's at. And we just want to find her so bad. Wendy Long's disappearance is a classic missing person case. Because she is 21, Wendy is considered an adult. Until any proof of foul play is found, police cannot officially consider the case an abduction or a homicide. What happened to Wendy Elizabeth Long? Police and Wendy's parents seek your help to solve this agonizing mystery. In the spring of 2001, Wendy Long decided to take a semester off from college and was planning to continue her studies in the fall. During this time, Wendy lived with her parents. The Longs considered her strong-willed, yet very open and friendly. One of her flaws may have been that she's too trusting. She thought everybody she met was her friend. She was one of those people that made friends with everybody. Shortly after noon on Friday, Wendy left her parents' home, driving her own car, and headed to Shreveport, 50 miles from Cushata. On the way, she picked up two friends from Natchitoches. <laughs> Following an afternoon of shopping, the three picked up another friend, Tommy, who lived in the Shreveport area. At approximately 11 p.m., they arrived at a Shreveport party. 
uh, there was drinking at the party, uh, and I'm told that Wendy would had quite a bit to drink that night. So that when it came time for them to take Tommy back home, she didn't want to drive. In fact, she didn't want to go with them at all. She decided to stay where she was. Are you okay to drive? Her two friends that she came to Shreveport with drove Tommy back to where he was staying at the time. After leaving Tommy, Wendy's friends had a run-in with the law. Their statement is that they went to get some food and they were stopped by a state trooper. And one of the friends was arrested for DWI and taken to the Benton Jail. When questioned by police, Tommy explained that he was concerned that Wendy might be stranded at the party. He chose to drive his own vehicle to find Wendy and offer her a ride back home to Cushata. Tommy says Wendy accepted the offer. On the way, he stopped for gas and a quart of oil. When he came back out of the, the gas station, Wendy was talking to two young men in a black Chevy truck. Hey, Tommy, come here. This is Mike and Zant. Tommy said that it appeared that she knew them. And Wendy told Tommy at that point not to worry about it, that she was going to go with them and they were going to get her home. Are you sure you know these guys? I mean, Yes, I'm sure I know these guys. I will get home OK. Just go home. <laughs> All right. According to Tommy, the last time he saw Wendy was when she left with the two men. This alleged sighting made Tommy the last person to see Wendy before she disappeared. Tommy agreed to take a polygraph test, which according to police, he passed. Tommy did extremely well on the polygraph. Uh, the polygraph examiner himself was very impressed with him and the details that he could remember. At that point, they decided that it would be beneficial to hypnotize Tommy to see what else he could remember. Under hypnosis, Tommy was able to provide a more detailed description of the black Chevy pickup truck and the appearance of the two men who took Wendy away. His recollection enabled a police artist to produce these sketches of the men. But no one has come forward to identify them. In further investigating Wendy's disappearance, police discovered a puzzling incident. On the day after Wendy vanished, her ex-boyfriend in Shreveport claims to have received a message from her on his answering machine. Hey, Mark, this is Wendy. This is a mostly bad connection. Hear me? Hello? He said that the, it sounded like she was on a cell phone and he didn't hear everything that she said. He did clearly hear uh, the words, this is Wendy. He said the rest of it was very staticky, and he erased the message. At that time, he didn't even know that Wendy was missing. Wendy Long's missing persons case is filled with many more questions than answers. A key question involves another of Wendy's ex-boyfriends. Just tell me who you were with last Friday night. There are quite a few reports that indicate that there was some physical violence in between them. No! The thing that concerns me about Wendy's ex-boyfriend is the fact that another girlfriend of his came up missing years prior to this and that she was never found. But Wendy's ex-boyfriend apparently has an alibi. The boyfriend cannot be placed in Shreveport any time that Friday or Saturday. Uh, I consider him to be suspect only because of the prior things that happened. For Wendy Long's parents, the nightmare that began with a single phone call continues. We've had people call and said that they've been praying for us and praying for Wendy. I'm just trusting God to answer our prayers and to lead us to wherever Wendy might be. And I do still believe in miracles, and I believe it could still be a miracle that Wendy could be alive. Update. Eight months after Wendy's disappearance, Tommy, whose real name is Robert Stewart, was arrested for check fraud. 
police began to re-question him about inconsistencies in the story he told about the last time he saw Wendy Long. According to investigators, Stewart eventually broke down, confessed to the murder, and pinpointed the location of Wendy's body. Now a special bulletin. We ask you to pay close attention to this story about a young woman who is missing. Perhaps you may be able to help authorities determine what happened the day Rachel Cook disappeared. On the morning of January 10th, 2002, 19-year-old Rachel Cook went jogging in her Georgetown, Texas neighborhood. She left her house at approximately 9.30 a.m. wearing a green sports bra, gray shorts, gray shirt tied around her waist, white running shoes, and a bright yellow armband Walkman. Witnesses spotted her at various points along her route that morning. At 11 a.m. near the end of her run, she was approximately 200 yards from her home in the North Lake subdivision of Georgetown, and that was the last known sighting of Rachel. She is five feet two inches tall and weighs about 120 pounds. Her hair is blonde with dark auburn streaks in it. She has hazel eyes. Rachel also has multiple piercings in both ears, two heart-shaped cherry tattoos on her left shoulder, and a black star tattoo on her left foot. Hundreds of cases like those you have seen have been solved with the help of our viewers. Join me next time. Perhaps you will solve a mystery.